You're listening to Investify, preaching financial independence and assisting investors to achieve a more flexible and free lifestyle through smart financial planning and real estate investing. If leaving the corporate world and jumping into this thriving industry is what you desire, tune in and listen to stories of like-minded individuals who made the leap to financial independence. Equip yourself with the right tips and tricks to start your real estate journey, making active or passive ventures that are highly profitable and rewarding. What's going on, everybody? You are listening to Investify. My name is Craig Curlop, aka The Fi Guy, and I'm here with my co host, Mr. Chad the Dad Rocky. What up, Chad? Hey, Craig. How you doing today? I am doing well. How are you? Um, No complaints today. Good, man. How's, how's the dad life? Oh, it's great. I feel like every day. She, uh, all of her, or she's two and a half now. Uh, it's just speaking more, like pretty full sentences together, and she's pretty much past the potty training, which she picked up on pretty quick. Um, so yeah, it's, it's awesome. That's awesome, man. Yeah, super, super exciting as your as your daughter grows. So does your real estate portfolio and your net worth. And did you buy her a house when she was born? You know. Like not technically, but um, well, of course. But there's this uh, sub two house that actually used to be my aunt's house. I, I worked with her on it. It's in it's in um, Wisconsin, and I've had in the back of my head of like, okay, like it'll be paid off in like eleven years. So she'll be like thirteen, and it's like, here, here's your house. And you can either move to Milwaukee if you want, or sell it and fund your education or something. So. Not technically, but sort of in the back, back of my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you kind of, yeah, you kind of had a house for her to just, yeah, that's that's awesome. And I know a lot of people um, do that, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, I think like, you know, if you just buy a house for yourself, quote unquote, when a, a son or daughter is born, and then, you know, you wait 18, 20 years, and it's probably going to have a good amount of at least a couple hundred thousand of equity in it. There's your college education. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the intent there. If, if, yeah, if, if you decide to go that route, but um, awesome, man. Well, speaking of college, speaking of all this great stuff, uh, we've got an amazing guest today, um, Andrew Freed, who Andrew, it, it was kind of funny. I met Andrew at Bigger Pockets Conference uh, down in, in uh, Orlando in October of 2023. I He was from Worcester, which is where I'm from. So it kind of stuck out to me as someone that I felt like I should talk to. And I just so happened to be going to Worcester to visit my family the next week. And he had a meetup, like the like Worcester's biggest meetup that did not have a speaker for that next week, which is like kind of crazy to think about. Like usually speakers are lined up a couple of months in advance for these things, I feel. And so at least ours is in Denver, like our, our speakers are usually pretty lined up. And so it was kind of like a serendipitous thing where I was going to Worcester. He was from Worcester. He needed a speaker at the meetup. I spoke at the meetup. It went pretty well. And now we've kind of become become friends and kind of been in touch ever since. And so it's, it's, it's really good to go to these conferences kind of just for that reason is like the connections that you make and the people that you can just know, uh, is worth, it's, it's worth the ticket. I wouldn't even go to the, see the speakers or go and actually look at like, and like, I don't really care to be educated about that stuff anymore. I just go for the people and it's worth, that's worth its weight in gold, the ticket value. That's awesome. It was meant to be. Yeah, it was. Uh, and you'll, you'll hear, you'll hear Andrew in his story. Like Andrew, I love, what I love about Andrew's story is that it's, it's fairly repeatable. He did get lucky, but I think when you start taking action, you tend to get lucky a little bit more, um, just a, a little bit lucky with some crypto stuff. Um, and, and maybe with buying real estate kind of around the right time, but like, who knows, like people in three or four years from today might think, man, whoever bought in 2024 was super lucky. Cause yeah, rates were high. But prices were pretty compressed because once these rates drop, everybody kind of knows that prices will likely spike again. And so we'll see what happens. Um, but but yeah, let's bring on Mr. Andrew Freed. This episode of Investify was brought to you by the FI team, a team of investor-friendly agents that service all 50 states. If you are looking to house hack, to invest, grow your portfolio, and want a true investor-friendly agent on your side, go to thefiteam.com and click Get Started, and we can't wait to have a good conversation with you. 
Andrew Freed. Welcome to the show, my friend. How you doing today, dude? I am excited to be here. Thank you for having me, Craig. Dude, we are pumped to have you on. We are repping right now. Some Central Mass natives here, yeah? Yeah, yeah. You're you're just right next door to my hometown. Well, my, my investing hometown, Worcester. So, yeah. Chad, Chad, how's it feel, man? How's it feel to be outnumbered right now? Uh, I assume you guys are Patriots fans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we we well, were. We were. <laughs> we were. <laughs> yeah, we were. Yeah. Now, we're going to wait a few more years until... Tom Brady Jr. comes back in and maybe helps us That's out. About right. Yeah. I'm a well, Packer, fit, Packer fan, uh, Andrew, so <laughs> from Wisconsin, but. Uh, well, sorry to hear that. Uh, <laughs> all right, Andrew. Well, speaking of Patriots, speaking of dynasties, speaking of greatness, why don't you kick us off where you, where it all started with you and your journey towards financial independence? I'm happy to kick it off. So it all starts back when COVID started and I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I came to the epiphany that, do I really want to work for 30 or 40 more years? Or do I just want to give it a shot right now? I'll go bankrupt and still retire in 30 or 40 more years. It's still such a, a long time horizon, right? So I did the normal kind of American dream where I got a good education. I got my master's. I, I got a, good, uh, a, a six-figure job at a good institution. Got a nice swanky condo in the city, right? And I essentially made it. However, come around COVID, I really looked at my net worth and I came to the realization that it literally took me 10 years to save up $50,000. Before that, I mean, my net worth was around $250,000. $200,000 was was in my one bedroom condo I bought back in 2015. So I really saw the power of real estate and it just opened my eyes. I can't believe uh, we're talking like pre-COVID is a long time ago. It just seems like COVID was yesterday. So it's amazing. Like I'm excited to hear your story of how quickly or how, how you took action, but it's just kind of funny to think of like, I started pre COVID and now here we are, I guess it is almost, well, basically four years ago at this point, but (laughs) no, I'm excited to hear it. Yeah. What's funny is that like almost your, your time in real estate before COVID is almost your time in real estate after COVID, uh, where like you bought your first condo in 2015. And I, I think it's funny looking at someone's overall net worth portfolio. And looking at your 50,000 saved from your job and 200,000 from the condo. And it's good that you had that wherewithal and like even calculating your net worth. And so curious, like, you know, from the beginning, like, or like, what, what were you doing in your job? So I'm actually a grant manager at a research institution. So I help researchers primarily at MIT and Harvard submit grants for research. So I'm kind of the finance guy, do the budgeting. uh, I do the applications. I make sure they follow the regulations. I'm more or less a project manager, which translated well to being successful in real estate. Because at the end of the day, to be successful in real estate, you really do need strong project management skills. 100%. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like what what did you learn from your job that you think you could apply in real estate? And what is project management? So project management more or less is coming up with uh, keeping people accountable, right? Coming up with a game plan on how to tackle a large project and set it up into small incremental tasks and delegating it amongst all of the appropriate parties and more or less just you know following up and showing people are on task and showing things are done in a timely and urgent manner. Because as you know, in real estate, everything is urgent and applying urgency to projects is incredibly important to ensure quick stabilization of your property um, and, and eventually you know, pull equity out of it. Did you enjoy that job? I do enjoy that job and I still do enjoy that job. I have that job today. So, oh, okay. Awesome. Oh, you're still working your W2. I am still working my W2. I am, I own about 130 units. I self manage 30 units. I'm a GP in two syndications and I'm an investor focused agent. I have three agents under me. So, uh, project management has served, served me extremely well, especially when it comes to time management. That's insane. Bro. <laughs> no. Dang. All right. You're just like, you're, dro- you're dropping the little, you're dropping the little C, the little preview, the sneak peek about what we're going to unpack here in the next hour or so. And so, all right. So, so you're working this W2 job. You're still working it, but let's, let's take it back to like 2020, right? Um, where you, you realized that the W2 way maybe wasn't the way to really get ahead and build your net worth. And so you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Did you have any other mentors around you or was it just Rich Dad, Poor Dad? So it started with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then I, I found me, Kevin, um, on YouTube. And a lot of his earlier stuff was real estate related. So I, he kind of inspired me. And then I found Bigger Pockets, which really kind of set me in motion 
to really move into my first house hack. I think I heard Brandon Turner say like, you could house hack 10 multis in 10 years and have 30 units. And like, that seemed realistic to me, the house hack to save three, 5% every single year seems super realistic. And that was my initial plan kind of going into real estate was house hack 10 properties in 10 years and then sail off to the wind. So it's, so I'm reading between the lines here, but maybe not really, but it sounds like you probably started off in 2020 with a house hack. That's exactly correct. I started off with a house hack in Worcester, Massachusetts, a three unit property. I bought for $560,000. I brought, I think I brought five or 6% down from my HELOC on that, on that one bedroom condo. Um, and yeah, and I mean, essentially I live for free in that property. So Chad, you know what this sounds like? I do. This sounds like the full real, real, real deal. 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 Bada, bow. All right, Andrew, this is the first deal you ever did. It made you a for real investor. And so we want to, you kind of, you kind of, you kind of told us a little bit, but let's start from the beginning. Uh, so you mentioned it was a triplex. You bought it for what you say, 360? No, I actually bought it for $560,000 back okay. uh, December 2020. And back when I bought it, I essentially established the comps. I think the lowest comp before that was around selling for around $500,000. But this particular property, and I highly recommend this for new investors, it was as turnkey as it gets. The previous owner was a contractor. All the CapEx on the building was absolutely new besides one heating unit. And two units needed cosmetic upgrades. Additionally, two units were delivered vacant, right? So because of all of those components, I didn't have a lot of CapEx and I was able to bring it to stabilization extremely quickly. So I believe my mortgage on the property was around $3,200. Each unit at that time rented for $1,600. So I could live in one unit, rent the other two for $3,200 and live for free. And it was honestly, it was a dream come true. I found a fantastic property. I'm still friends uh, with that owner today. And so how did you find this property? So I ended up finding it because, well, first, I, was, I lived in Boston, right? I kept trying to find house hacks in Boston. However, the supply of multifamily is very small. So after I lost out on 20, 30, 40 offers, I became absolutely frustrated, right? And I really looked at the MLS. I'm like, where are there a lot of multis, right? And there were two options in Massachusetts. There was Brockton and there was Worcester, Massachusetts. And to put it in perspective, Brockton produces the highest concentration of champion level boxes. So I'm just going to leave it at that. But because of that, I decided to move to Worcester, Massachusetts, which is the second largest city in Massachusetts, about 45 minutes west of Boston. And the amazing thing in which I love about Worcester, 30 to 40 percent of the housing stock are multifamily. So it's very easy to find a deal. You want to know what's crazy is that my mom is from Worcester and my dad is from Brockton. There you go. <laughs> so, and my dad was like the number five, like best wrestler, like in the state or something growing up. So um, not surprised. Yeah. But I, I mean, he clearly the other top four were probably his neighbors or something. So maybe he wasn't as good as, uh, as he makes himself out to be. Um, but no, that's awesome, man. And so, so you got this property you, you found. So like, what was that? Did you move from Boston to Worcester? Yeah. So I actually uprooted my entire life. I had no friends in Worcester. I literally knew nobody. And I moved from my one bedroom condo in Boston and I HELOC'd it before I went. I rented out, which was a requirement of the loan. I had to get a lease prior to uh, closing. And then I moved into the three family, into the top unit, actually the worst unit. And I rented out the other two. Two things you said there that kind of sparked my interest. Uh, one is taking the HELOC before you move. I think for our listeners, that's a key point. If, if it's your primary residence and you're planning to invest or move, get the HELOC first. You get better rates. It's easier to, to do that. So that, that was awesome. And then the second point is living in the worst unit. Another um, good point of you want to cash flow the, the highest you can, making those short-term sacrifices of like, okay, I'll take the worst one. I'll take the basement one or whatever it might be is going to pay off in the long run. So yeah, love what you did there. I mean, you bring up a lot of good points in the fact that investment properties, lines of credit only go up to 75%. But when it's your primary residence, you have the ability to go up to 100% uh, of a line of credit or a HELOC, right? So one of my key strategies has been throughout my career is house hack HELOC, house hack HELOC, house hack HELOC, right? So I can actually utilize that equity once I leave. And I actually did that on the, my first house hack and I grabbed $75,000 out of that, which helps fund two additional deals, a house hack and I split a three family with my buddy. How come I haven't heard that before? Like that's, that's genius. I feel like as the house hacking guy, I, I feel like I'm, 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 I'm discrediting. Like I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm so mad. Like 
because I didn't do any HELOCs on any of my properties as primary residences. And one in particular I knew just blew up. But so are you do, but how much equity do you, I guess, do you really have in that first year? I guess that was always my thought. So, um, well, it was during COVID. So the market highly appreciated, right? And the other thing about when it comes to HELOCs and refinances in general is you can fight the appraisal, right? So for my first house hack, I think the appraisal came in at, I don't know, five, 490 and I paid 560 for the property. And I'm like, and I, and I, and I fought that I gave them comps and then they bumped it up to 560. And at that point I actually did a, I tried, I attempted to do a refinance three months prior and it was unsuccessful, but I had an appraisal in hand for 645,000. So I literally just gave that to the appraiser and they caught my property at 645,000. It was hundred percent HELOC. I paid 560 for it. They allowed me to grab $75,000 out of that property. And the amazing thing and why I do love HELOCs, interest only, right? So in regards to your debt, sir, in regards to your debt to income ratio, that lenders only take into account the interest only period. They don't take into account the principal. So that allows you to leverage the money a lot more and still be super loanable. Well, what, what question on that? Um, what's your strategy to pay back the HELOC? So my strategy is not to pay back the HELOC. My strategy is to keep the line running. And there's a couple different reasons for that. But primarily, we were going into a recession, right? And there's always the ability for them to pull the line of credit if values go down and or if they find out you move out of the property and you're not your primary residence anymore. So I would hate to pay down $100,000 on my line of credit, have it pulled and be out 100K. So more or less, I, I prefer to be strong in cash and have my line of credit pulled. That's amazing. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about appraisal disputes as well, because um, I don't think a lot of people know about that. And so this can be done when you go under contract for a property you're, you're doing. So if you're working out there with a, an agent that maybe is not as experienced, they may not know that they can dispute the appraisal. But I know that I've, I'm a, I've probably got a 50 or 60% success rate at disputing appraisals. Chad, I know you've had some success. Andrew, it's I know just based on the last story that you've had success. So it's it's not uncommon to dispute an appraisal. And I want to say one thing too, is that we went to get a HELOC on our primary residence. And one appraiser came in on Monday and gave us a value um, at, let's just say like 890,000 is what they valued it at. And literally three days later, I didn't like that appraisal. And so three days later, I got it. We got another appraiser in there. They appraised it for 1.0 or 1.06 million. So literally like a hundred and fifty thousand dollar difference. And so the so there's two points to that is that one, it kind of just depends on the appraiser's day. Two, don't get so caught up in like what you think the house is worth based on the appraisal. Because really it's just someone's opinion of value. And don't back out of a deal just because the appraisal comes in low. Yeah, I would say uh don't get me started on appraisals. I, I could go all day about them. They, they uh, but I will just echo everything you said. Of uh, like, it's one person's opinion. It might not mean crap. Like you got, you just don't give up. Like there's other ways. I think we've all, Craig and Andrew, have seen of just because one person says it, um, that's not the one I'll be all. Yeah, I mean, and just to add to that point, whenever I get a property on a contract for myself or my clients, I always provide a comp package to the appraiser, showing where the comps at, showing where the rentals are at, right? And out of all of my transactions, and I've done dozens and dozens and dozens of transactions, I think I've only dealt with two appraisal issues. So providing a comp package upfront negates a lot of those issues. Additionally, when you're refinancing and you're doing a line of credit, the appraiser doesn't have a value to go off of. When you're buying a property, they go off of the offer value. But when it comes to a refinance or a line of credit, they go off what they think it's worth, right? So it's incredibly important when you do those kinds of uh, funding opportunities, um, refinance or a uh, line of credit, is to give the appraiser a comp package and let them know where it should land. Totally. Totally. I love that, man. Awesome, man. And so so you you rented this, you bought this house for 560 Did you just use the FHA loan? I did use an FHA loan, yes. And because I think it was below the FHA allowed amount in that area, because like I said, I established a comp. So I think I came in at like five or six or 7% down. Um, all came from my line of credit. Okay. So you essentially funded this first deal all with like not really your own cash. I mean, it was your 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 net worth, I guess, but not your actual cash. And you you said your monthly PITI on that was 3,200. You were getting 1,600 a unit. So essentially you were living for free if you had roommates, they were even probably, did you have roommates? 
I did not have roommates. Okay. So you were basically living break even for for that first, you know, the first couple of years or whatever. Um, what did you do when you moved out? So when I moved out, I actually turned the unit, um, did a cosmetic upgrade. I think I paid around ten or $15,000, you know, just a normal cosmetic. It was all wood floors. So I just refinished the floors. I did um, LVP in the kitchen and the bathroom, uh, pay, you know, put, put new cabinets in. Um, did for Micah countertops. And I believe I rented that unit for $1,900. So, um, and currently the building brings around $5,600 in revenue. Wow. And still on that $3,200 payment. I think it went up a little bit because of taxes and insurance might be at like 3,600 now. Okay. But still you're, you're netting over a thousand bucks a month on this partially probably because what was your interest rate on that? <laughs> Two two 2.375. 2.375. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's nice. the lowest I've heard. Yeah, that, you're, you're never going to refinance that one. No, not, and I'm never going to use an FHA loan again because that's my FHA loan. Unless I, move a, unless I move 100 miles away, I think you get a second one if you move a certain distance. So. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, man. So, so this is, I mean, this is kind of a great first story. Obviously, like, it's not as applicable to as it is today. But, like, what were some of like this? But, I, like, I bought properties in 2022, right? Uh, like, it, it was not... Not it was still scary to buy in 2020, even though like looking back, it looked like oh the interest rates are so low and properties prices weren't so low, but like at the time, like what were you feeling? I was feeling extremely scared. I was questioning whether this was a good deal. I was paying 50, 60k above the highest comp in the area, and I was I was seriously questioning whether this was a good opportunity or not. Thankfully, I had a very talented investor focused agent that already owned three or four properties and reassured me day in and day out that it was a good property. And I'm eternally grateful to, that I followed through with uh, with his advice. Absolutely. So, you know, I think a good good piece of advice there is, is trust the professionals. But also number two is it's always like three years ago is always going to be better than than today, right? In 2020, like we were at the top of the market. Everyone was saying prices are so high. Prices are so high. Prices are so high. No one was talking about how low interest rates were. I didn't remember hearing that at all. It was only prices were high. Prices were high. Prices were high. And now it's, Prices are still kind of high, but now it's all about the interest rates. And not to mention the the world was ending with COVID. Like you couldn't even go through showings. And there's always some reason or excuse of COVID, a war, recession is in is looming, whatever it might be. There's, you know, an election year, all these things that people just talk about and watch the news on. But great to your point, like the best time to buy real estate was sometime in the past. Uh, and so time is on your side of you get in and, and you have time and you, and you wait. Yeah. And, and to your point, I think fear is a good indicator of when you should buy. I mean, what's Warren Buffett say, get greedy when others get fearful and get fearful when others get greedy. And that's exactly has been my, my strategy through all my investing career in 2023. Everybody says that was historically the worst time to buy yet. I purchased a hundred units, right? And now I look like a genius because interest rates are coming down and all these properties are cash flowing pretty well, even at those high interest rates. Right. So I think I think if you sense fear in the market, if you sense hesitancy, I think that should be your indicator to buy and not listen to the noise. Yeah, because you don't have to go 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars above asking these days. You can just you yeah. can get it at or below. You, you can kind of like like we have sellers wrapped around our fingers oftentimes because they just don't have any buyers. And so like, yeah. The one downside is you got higher interest rates, but that's what's causing all these other great things to happen. So something's got to give. Uh, Andrew, one last thing on this property is what is it? So, you know, it's cash flowing you a little over a thousand bucks a month today. What is your, like, how much do you think it appreciated? I mean, Zillow has it as $750,000. I mean, I would probably say it's, it's worth a good $700,000. It's, it's all the CapEx is completely in great shape. The only thing is there's one old heating unit, but all the units have been turned cosmetically. Um, the roof is new, electrical's updated, plumbing's updated. It's honestly one of the gems of my portfolio. Mm. And so I just want to kind of like just recap, right? But because of that purchase you made in 2020, you now have this asset that's producing a thousand plus a month in cash flow. It's increased one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand um, dollars, certainly more than you would have saved at your at your W two job. And and that's just that's just one property, right? Imagine what happens when you multiply that by two, three, four, a hundred and thirty, wherever you're at. And so, why don't you kind of tell us as to how where you went after that first house hack? 
So after I went after that first health hack, I still had a decent amount of money on my line of credit. So at that point, I decided my one of my uh, mentors was putting a syndication together locally, 132 unit in Lowell, Massachusetts. So I actually took a, a $65,000 um, from my line of credit, which I was paying 3% on, and this opportunity was offering a 15% return, and I put it into that syndication. A year later, that syndication sold for an 89% return. So they gave me back my initial $65,000 and gave me, I think, a $60,000 check, which I transitioned into a five-unit property that I split 50-50 with somebody. But my actual next multi that I bought was right across the road. This was 150 Ingleside. I bought, sorry, this was 151 Ingleside. I bought 150 Ingleside. It's kind of a, it's kind of a funny story because the person that I bought the property from, he calls me up one day. He's like, you know, your neighbor's trying to sell. He's knocking on everybody's door. And I like, I threw on a shirt. I ran downstairs. I'm like, oh, you're trying to sell that? He's like, yeah. And he told me the price. It was like $450,000. Pro form on the property, I believe was like, I don't know, $4,300, $4,400. Seemed like a really good deal. So I took an 80 k from my line of credit. And then I sold $40,000 from stock and crypto, which honestly was a fantastic time to sell uh, crypto. Um, and I used that to buy an investment property uh, right across the road. Wow. And did you buy this one with 20% down, kind of the old-fashioned way? I believe it was 25% down. Okay, 25% way, triple. And this was in 2000, what year was this? Uh, this was uh, 2021, uh, March, I believe, no, sorry. Uh, I think March or April uh, of 2021. And I mean, 80K of that came from my line of credit. So theoretically, I only paid $40,000 for this property. Wow. So, so, okay. So you've got, you've got, now you've got the second property across the street. Now kind of market conditions at this time, COVID is kind of settling, right? Or people are just like used to it. It's not that big of a deal. You're wearing masks and stuff, but like, whatever, I guess, how much is the monthly payment on that? Where I, for, I for, kind of forget where rates were at this time. Still pretty low, right? Yeah. So I believe the monthly payment on that was around $2,300. And I think I, day one, I got the revenue up to around $4,200. So, um, yeah, it was a great property. And just the fact that it was across the road and made the management so easy. One of my tenants actually kind of acts as the super and does like the snow removal, the landscaping. So the management of these properties is, is literally, I could do it in my sleep. So, and you said this, was this a duplex or a triplex? This was a triplex right across the road, three units, all two bed units, as opposed to one fifth angle side, which was all three bed units. Okay. And these are all stacked on, these are the classic triple deckers, right? This all stacked on top of each other. All mirror image units. Yeah. Stacked one, two, three. Dude, I, I, every time I go home, man, and I'm just like driving down just the Worcester streets or even in, in Boston, I'm just like, I look at those triple deckers. I'm just like, oh man, like if only we lived here still. I just felt like there's so many, right? Whereas in a lot of other cities, Denver, there's hardly any multifamily units. It's really, really hard to come by. Um, how do you deal with, okay, so Massachusetts, right? You're talking a very, very blue state um, with very, very tenant-friendly laws. And so mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that really try to steer clear of the Northeast for that reason uh, and many other reasons just with you know weather and all that kind of stuff. And so ca have you had any issues with just being in a tougher state to be a landlord in? So people view that as a negative, but I view it as a positive. That means I have lower competition than everybody, right? And if you know how to work the market, you can make it work. And that's exactly what I did. For, to, to be successful in Massachusetts, you have to have a high level of emotional intelligence. You have to be able to negotiate with the tenants. If that doesn't work, you have to be able to offer cash for keys, come up with some amenable solution. If that doesn't work, you simply hire an eviction attorney, give them the case, wait four to six months until they get out, you know? Um, and what I see from a lot of people who aren't successful in this day is they take that, they take this personally, like it's business. Like what's the ROI calculation? Like, does it make sense for me to pay a tenant thousand, fifteen hundred dollars for them to get out of my unit four to six months earlier? Absolutely. All day. I could rent that or I could rent that out and get additional five, six thousand dollars in revenue. Right. So I think a lot of people who are successful in landlord friendly, uh, sorry, in tenant friendly states, they have to have a high level of emotional intelligence and they have to be able to create win-win scenarios for everybody. Yeah. I love, I love that. Um, I think there's a lot, there's a lesson that for, from that for everything kind of that business owners and entrepreneurs do in life of if it's, if it's easy and there's uh, no obstacles, then uh, you know, everybody jumps into it where you find success is, is doing things that is hard and 
like for your instance of like, if you have the systems, you have the lawyer, you have the process in place and you're comfortable with it, maybe there's a couple of hoops, but that's going to lower your competition and you're going to, you're going to crush it. I think that applies to many things in life. Yeah. I mean, and I'll just give you one really quick example as well. Later, later on in my investing career, I bought 60 prob industry, which is a six unit in Massachusetts, all four quasi five bed units, right? So these, it's a massive building, 8,000 square feet. We got this building from a wholesaler for a million dollars. Day one, it appraised for $1.2 million. The issue there was it had a rough tenant base, right? So day one, we had to deal with two evictions. I will deal with two evictions all day to make $200,000. That's the easiest $200,000 I can ever make, right? So I was willing to deal with problems other people weren't willing to do. And as a result, my net worth is $200,000 higher. Absolutely. And, and that's what it is, right? Is people pay. People will pay to have their problem solved. And that's what that that's what that seller did. But that's you know, well, the wholesaler found the seller who had a problem, took it, took it at a discount, probably took it at 950, sold it to you for a million, and there was still so much meat on the bone, you know, for you. And so like when that property was all stabilized, how did it look like from a cash flow perspective? We are still currently stabilizing the property. We actually just finalized uh, our last eviction uh, over there. Uh, but once stabilized, the uh, each unit will rent for twenty three, twenty four hundred dollars times six. I mean, what's that? Twelve, thirteen thousand in in revenue, and we paid a million dollars. It's like that the one point three percent rule, right? So the thing's gonna cash flow like a bandit uh, once we get it stabilized, which should be in a couple months, hopefully. That's amazing. And so, how did you grow and scale, man? So you were at you were at your house hack. You you know you got your house hack. You got the one across the street with the HELOC um, and your crypto and all that. And so like. How did you go from, you know, I mean, we talked maybe about eight to 10 of your units. How do you go from that to a hundred and something? Uh, I, I more or less just did the bigger pockets recipe. You know, I listened to all the podcasts. I ended up finding a mentor who owns hundreds of units and I, I became his student because I brought him value. He was actually looking for somebody to start a meetup in Worcester, Massachusetts. So I went out of my way that weekend uh, when he when he told me about this to to research five or six revin uh sorry, five or six venues put together pricing information get pictures together send it to him on you know these being fantastic uh, venues for the meetup and he actually decided to allow me to host the meetup so I just I, I hosted a meetup in Worcester Massachusetts I also brought my mentor value in the form of becoming an becoming an investor focused agent on his team and bringing him commissions right so because I brought him value every single time I ran into an issue. He was a two minute call away, right? And and he could give me, um, he could resolve my problems in literally one or two minutes, which with with which without him, it would take me days to resolve, right? So leaning on somebody who's actually at who's actually where you want to be at is incredibly important, right? Um, so that's kind of what got got me started and really allowed me to scale. Um, and also joint venturing. Once I kind of started to move into the bigger commercial properties. I decided to joint venture because those are much more easier to uh, refinance your money out because the because it's based on the income approach and not the sales comp approach. So it's just it's way easier to to uh, to provide value to bring up value on those properties as well. This episode of Investify was brought to you by the Fi Team, a team of investor friendly agents that service all fifty states. If you are looking to house hack, to invest, grow your portfolio, and want a true investor-friendly agent on your side, go to thefiteam.com and click Get Started, and we can't wait to have a good conversation with you. Could you just dive a little bit more into like joint venture, maybe take it a step back for our listeners of what that is and what that structure looks like? Absolutely. So in my investing career, my first 10 units, I purchased with house hacks with my HELOC. At that point, I decided to move on to commercial properties. And when you're doing a joint venture, that, that more or less means you're buying a property with two, three, four people with normally like a, under an LLC, right? So my first joint venture was a five unit, uh, 35 up Solid Street in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I actually used those profits from that syndication I sold and I split that 50-50 with somebody. And then we, we got our, you know, we set up an LLC, we got a commercial lender. Um, and we closed on the property, and that property honestly was one of my best performing properties as well, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about. Well, and so, how do you how do you decide on who to joint venture with? So, the key to figuring out who you partner, who's the ideal partner for you, is figuring out what are your weaknesses and what are their strengths, and and um and and joining forces with somebody who makes up your weaknesses. So, this particular person I met at a meetup. 
they are very um, they are very good with talking with contractors, with talking with tenants, with dealing with capex and renovation. And I'm really good. Obviously, I'm, I have a project management background. I'm really good on the computer. I'm really good with leases. I'm really good with administrative items. I'm really good with working with banks, right? But I don't like. I mean, I'm good at it, but I don't like dealing with that other part. So I thought to my mind, like, who is really good at the components I don't like doing? And my partner Zach Gray came to mind. I called him up about the deal. He said, "Let's freaking go!" And we bought the property, and it's been a fantastic investment. And so, did you guys split everything fifty fifty? You split, you know, the money, the investment fifty fifty, the profits fifty fifty. It sounds like the workload is split fifty fifty. That's exactly correct. That's exactly what we do. Um, and Zach Zach Gray is actually my partner today, and we do it a little different now that we kind of raise money from investors. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of how we set up that structure: fifty fifty, fifty percent cash. 50% responsibilities. I um, mean, it's worked out great. So I always see tr- joint ventures working in two separate ways. I see them working kind of how you mentioned where like roles are split, everything is split 50-50. But I also see it in the way of there's a hustler and there's a capital provider, right? Have you done the the latter where someone is providing the capital 100% and you're not providing any, but just all the work? That, that's exactly correct. So, you know, my first 10 units was with my own money, my next 20 units with the joint ventures. And at that point, I ran out of my own money. So I decided to kind of raise money from investors. And I was the person that brought the expertise. I was the person that found the deal. I was the person that stabilized the property. And what they brought with was, was they brought capital, right? But because me and my partner are doing the sweat equity component, we get a piece of the pie. And that's really how we, I expanded from 30 units to 130 units in about a year. So how do you realize... Or how do you even ask for money for investors? Like how how can how do you have that confidence to go ahead and and do that? So initially, it's it's awkward as hell. I'm not gonna lie; it's extremely awkward. But the more you do it, the better you get. And you really have to come from the mindset as you're offering people opportunity, and you're not trying to sell them anything. Like I'll give you a quick example. My my mother, she has her money in her 401k. Her her wealth provider gives her a it's been a 3% annualized return in the past five years, which historically has been the best bull market in history. Like that's in a, a horrendous return. Like I went to her, I'm like, I can give you a 10% return on your money if you let me borrow it, right? She took that all day. It's a 7% difference, right? So you, so it, it's all about pre- presenting it, um, finding opportunity and presenting it to people who, who don't have those opportunities in day-to-day life. I always have the conversation of um, like proof of concept. It's so much easier having that conversation when you can, you know, once you get one, two, three, ten deals under your belt, and then you go to someone who's working the W two, they got a hundred k, two hundred k, you know, just sitting in the bank or getting the three percent, and you go to them as an authoritative figure and like a proof of concept of like this is what I've done. I think their eyes open up of like, yeah, I, I trust this guy. Um, he's done it before. And so, you know, getting to that point is huge. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're exactly correct. And that's exactly what I did. My first 30 units were, were with my own money, right? Um, and then at that point, I got on the Bigger Pockets podcast. I was putting a bunch of social media content. Out. I was building credibility where people actually saw what I was doing and trusted in me to really make investments successful. So to your point, that's exactly what I did to grow. That's amazing. And so how do you, like, what's your ideal way to structure a deal today if you're like raising money from other people? Are you finding the deal first or you get people committed first or is it kind of how it happened at the same time? The way I do it, the way me and my partner do it is we find the deal first, right? And then we put, we, 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 we have a CRM in place with over a thousand people that we've, you know, befriended over the years. Um, and then we put an investment uh, opportunity together and send it out to, to our uh, potential investors. Um, and yeah, we, you know, we get some bites, we jump in the phone, we talk about the deal. If it makes sense, we, you know, move forward, we set up an LLC. We, we, we normally do some sort of pref with some uh, pref return with some sort of split. Um, and then we handle all the components of it. And, um, you know, and if it's a JV deal, you do have to offer them some sort of active role or it's considered passive. So we normally have some sort of quarterly or, or meeting, I'm going over kind of the stabilization plan and and getting their insights, so they do have some sort of active role, so they can't participate in a joint venture deal. Is it typically um, like a like a two year return basis, or what's like the structure of that uh, like that payback period? It all depends on the opportunity, right? So we we I did a syndication, a sixty nine unit syndication in New Bedford, Massachusetts. The split there, and this was my first syndication, was a seven percent preferred return with a 70-30 split. So 
Uh, our investors got 70% of the upside, the cash flow, the refinance money, the, the sale proceeds, and we got 30% of the upside. And that is after uh, the 7% preferred return. So that And the way we structured that particular deal, we bought 12 separate properties and it was a hybrid approach. So it was kind of a half flip, half buy and hold in the fact that we, we were selling off the smaller properties, the four to five unit properties to retail investors, getting the max dollar per unit, getting our investors back their capital as quickly as possible, while simultaneously stabilizing larger properties with the hopes of refinancing and potentially exiting five years down the road. I love that, man. And so are you, are you fine? Are you, when you, when you raise money from investors, are you just raising the money for the down payment 25% or are you trying to get the whole thing funded from your investors? We get the whole thing funded, including the stabilization uh, cost as well as the down payment. From, from your pr- private investors. That's exactly correct. The only thing me and my partner fund is due diligence costs. So if we don't move forward, me and my partner lose those funds. Yes. Okay. And then are you not making a dollar until that 30% or are there any sort of fees that you charge up front? I, we don't charge any fees. I'm incentivized to make the property perform. So I, we don't provide any, we don't uh, do any asset management fees. We don't do any acquisition fees, right? And we don't get paid until our investors get that preferred return. And then at that point, both us and them participate in the upside. So more, so more or less our incentives are aligned and, and we like it that way. How many um, partners do you usually have or investors do you usually, like what's the ideal number? It really depends on the opportunity. Like I own a 32 unit in Lancaster, South Carolina. I think we have 10 investors on that. That was a larger deal. Um, And then some of the smaller deals, we probably have three, four, you know, investors. It really depends on the size of the deal, how much capital people are willing to bring. I mean, it's always ideal to have less partners. It's less of an administrative burden, Uh, but you take what you can get, right? So do you have any sort of minimum requirements for amount funded per deal? Yeah. I mean, owning real estate's an ex- expensive endeavor. So normally the minimum is around $50,000. 50000 Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so if somebody wanted to participate or whatever, uh, is this the asset you're doing? Do they have to be an accredited investor or is there a way around that? They do not. They, a lot of what we do are joint ventures. Um, and when we do syndications, we do we do set it up as a 506B, meaning you don't have to be an accredited investor. You can accept up to third, you can accept up to 35 non-accredited investors in a 506B, and then everybody after that is accredited. So for that syndication we did, a majority of our investors were not accredited. Okay. And can can you explain to us maybe like the difference between a JB and a syndication and why you might go one route or the other? Absolutely. So a joint venture is more or less an active investment, right? So everybody in this particular business, I mean, when you're buying a property, you're buying a business, they have to have some sort of active role in the business. So one of my other friends, she makes her her investors approve charges over $5,000. That's an active responsibility. What we do is we hold quarterly meetings, go over the investment and get people's insight on the stabilization plan and how to move forward. That's an active investment. That's an active role, I mean. But when you get into syndications, Your investors are passive, meaning they do nothing besides provide the money. So you have to be careful with taking money and not giving your investors a role, because if you don't, that's considered passive. And that really should fall under the the umbrella of a syndication. And when you do syndications, there's a lot more sunk costs in the form of legal fees. You got to pay a syndication attorneys to put a PPM document together, which more or less kind of the document everybody signs, agreeing to all the terms. You know, you, you have a lot of more closing costs involved. There's a lot more overhead associated with syndications. And because of that, syndications only make sense over a, do- a certain dollar threshold for a purchase price. You're obviously a, a extremely brilliant guy, but w- where did you like learn all this from? Is it kind of like trial and error or did you read a book or did was it podcasts or just like boots on the ground figuring this all out? I think I've listened to over six or 700 Bigger Pockets podcasts. I've listened to po- you know multiple podcasts every day for the past three years. I've read over 150 real estate books. I do the Miracle Morning, so I read 10, 15 pages a day, which add up to a lot of books over the years. Um, so it's it's been a lot, a lot of self-education. And um, to be honest with you, I eat and breathe this stuff on a daily basis. I commit three, four, five hours to self-education every single day. What's funny is, is it doesn't sound like you bought a $10,000 course or joined some crazy mastermind or anything like that, did you? I did not, but I did pay my time in the form uh, of being a real estate agent and starting that meetup for my mentor. So I paid with time. Right. And so I think it's, I think it's interesting. Um, I, I think there's a level of investing in yourself that needs to happen, whether that's self-education, sometimes it's paying to be part of a community or a course, but you have to know is that whoever is selling the course or selling the community or selling all of these things, 
you are very rarely will you see anywhere remotely the same success as that person who started it that is truly trying to sell you on the dream you won't achieve that dream because there's a first mover advantage which the leader of that course that you're thinking about buying has and so you won't achieve the same success you might achieve a small fraction of that success so i just need everybody to like think about that before you go spend thousands thousands of dollars on that when you could be spending 10 15 20 thousand dollars on a house hack which will actually provide you a legit investment you're actually just going to learn stuff and then go out to meetups right if every single city i think almost every city in the us probably has a bigger pockets meetup or some sort of real estate meetup attend if you don't like it start your own just like andrew did and make it how you like it because if you don't like it i guarantee you there's 20 to 30 to 50 other people that don't like it and they're going to want and be excited for a great meetup yeah yeah i mean you're exactly correct if there isn't a meetup start a meetup because you instantly become a subject matter expert deal flow will instantly start coming your way um and you really gain connections in the form of getting guest speakers you can get the best investors in your area to come speak in your meetup and you uh, you instantly establish a rep uh, a um relationship with them right so there's so many benefits to starting a meetup that it's it's innumerable i mean it's i i highly recommend this for every investor 100 percent. and so how do you uh, so you've got like so many different things going on, right? You've got your W-2, you've got your investing business, you've got your agent business. What is taking priority right now? Like, well, how is your time spent? And then how do you have time for anything else? Um, so the real key to that I have, the real key to managing all of these competing priorities is building a strong team, right? So I have three virtual assistants. I have an executive assistant that manages my, my um, email that does... Um, a lot of task-based things um, that manages um, other components of my business. I have a social media VA that I simply shoot the content. They make it look pretty. They do the captions. I post it once a day. I have a bookkeeper virtual assistant that makes sure all of my books are, are up to date. In addition to this, I also have three investor-focused agents underneath me, right? So I really just feed them leads and really just provide strategy and, and let a lot of investors leverage the network that I've built over the years. But they do a lot of the legwork in the form of visiting properties, in the form of putting offers in, right? And we, me and my partner also hired an assistant property manager, an 18-year-old kid looking for a mentorship. So more or less, we set him up with a paid mentorship. And he does a lot of our property management. So he does a lot of tenant communications. He does a lot of the um, meeting with contractors. He, he even does real estate things for me. You know, if, you, if I want to show a property, if I want to do a smoke sorter, if I want to set up an appraiser, appraisal, he does that for me, right? So I'm really good at, at figuring out what do I, what takes up the most time? What takes the most energy from me? And who can I put in that seat to take that responsibility away from me? Hmm. I love that. The delegate, the project management piece, right? I mean, it's still, it's still coming into play, just kind of like at a higher level and kind of like your whole life. Uh, and so that, I mean, so, so your story, man, just to kind of recap, right? It all starts with a house hack in 2020, a triple decker in Worcester. Uh, you continue to, you know, invest, maybe get a little lucky with crypto and all that kind of stuff, but that's okay. Like, I don't think luck really exists. I think you have to play to get lucky and most people are just afraid to play. And so mm -hmm. kudos to you for not being afraid to play. Uh, you, you took what you had, you bought more real estate, you grew into JVs that now you're kind of doing more syndications, doing bigger stuff. And so are you still house hacking every year? I am. I'm in my second house hack right now, and I'm already pre-approved for my third house hack. I have a property under contract. Unfortunately, mid 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 deal, the seller didn't want to sell anymore. It was a four unit with an illegal fifth, so it was like it was like an ideal house hack. So I keep poking the seller, like, "Hey, take my offer." But uh, I am actively looking for another house hack. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and so what I think is what I think is fun funny with all this stuff uh, um, is you have all these trends and these gurus that kind of come and go, right? Where it's like. Burr was was really popular a little while ago, and then medium term rentals and short term rentals and mobile home, whatever. S like syndications was really popular a couple of years ago when rates were low, and that. And the, but like one thing that just kind of stays the whole time is the house hack. Like Andrew, you're you're beyond house. You don't need to house hack anymore, right? Um, but it just makes sense. David Green, he still house hacks because it makes sense. Chad, are you house hacking? I'm house hacking. Chad is house hacking. I am still house hacking. Like house hacking just makes sense. And so you don't need to, you know, the house hacks that that I'm doing now or I, I do now is not necessarily like, I didn't run the numbers on it. It was a pure happiness play. Like it was, it was a house we really loved, but it had some extra space. We're renting it out, 
right? And so whatever you're doing, if you're not house hacking, you're being wildly inefficient. I think it all starts with that. And then you grow your other strategies as you become more and more experienced. Building wealth is all, all about having a strong offense, but is also about having a strong defense, right? You're not going to get wealthy if you make ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month, yet you spend ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month. But you will get wealthy if you spend two, three thousand dollars a month and you make fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a month. And that's exactly how I was able to scale and able to buy all this real estate so quickly. Is I live like a college student and I buy real estate like like nobody else. So <laughs> that's how I've been able to kind of scale so quickly. Andrew, I don't think we hit on this, but tell me what's like your family life like? Are you are you married? Do you have kids? I am uh, single. I don't have kids, right? So I'm doing this while I uh, while I have all this available time, right? So I've committed um, I've committed all of my time over the past three years to do all of this, and I'm I mean I'm not I'm not at financial independence yet, but I'm really damn close, right? So three years of hard work, three years of determination will create the life that everybody dreams of for the next fifty years, right? So. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to your point, to starting a family, to getting a relationship now that I've kind of built the night, uh, the wealth needed kind of for the rest of my life. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the ticket right there. Like if you're listening to this and you're single and by single, I mean, unmarried, I don't care if you have a girlfriend, like if you are unmarried, then now is the time to be like boots on the ground, nose to the ground, nose to the grindstone, get off Netflix, get off Tinder, get off of whatever only fans right like stop doing that stuff that's not taking anything and bring anything to your life and like pro be able to provide something for your future because like andrew i'm just saying whenever the lucky gal that you meet is meeting you like i'm i'm imagining that you're probably not you're probably gonna be able to provide for her and that like she probably won't need to work when you have kids someday she'll probably be able to stay home you'll save on daycare costs your kids will actually have a, a mom 24 7 and not some nanny that's getting paid a crazy amount of money, right? And like that to me is just so valuable. Uh, and, and that's what you need to be doing listening to this. I couldn't agree with that more. I guess I said it once before, and I think we all have the same mindset, but just the, the short-term sacrifice of, I mean, look what you've done in literally three years. It's insane. It, like you're in your house hacking, right? It, you're putting, you're probably working 12, 14 hour days. It's not comfortable. It's not easy, but if you can think about like sacrificing three, four, five years to be able to retire and then live, get your time back and do what you want to do. Um, I think our generation is maybe I surround myself with people, but we always talk like, it seems like our generation is a little bit more onto this than our parents' generation where they're like, we're proud to work 40 years, at the same job and work till they're 65 where I always like, there's other ways to do it. You don't need to do that. Um, so it's just incredible what you've been able to do in three years. Yeah, I can't say that more. And also, I don't want to just obviously we're, we're three men on the show right now, but I don't want to discredit like, you know, if you're a woman listening to the show, the same thing totally applies to you is like get like while you're single, while you don't have family obligations, like family takes up a lot of time. So use that time kind of that you're getting back right now wisely to build so that your family in the future can be provided for. Awesome, Andrew. Well, again, man, your, your story is super inspiring, especially because it's it's just it just happened in the last few years, right? You kind of started during COVID in a place where you feel like it's probably harder to get started. Massachusetts is expensive. Um, it is, uh, the taxes aren't great there. The landlord laws aren't great there. And so there's so many obstacles that people say, why would you want to invest in Massachusetts? Myself included. Um, but you still figured out a way. Uh, and so- um, I guess like what's next for you? So I'm trying to close on a hundred units this year. That's my goal. I believe we have 30 or 40 units under contract right now. So things are definitely moving along. We're only a month into the year. So maybe I should shut up my goal. Um, and my eventual goal is I would love to travel for six months out of the year. I would love to help 10,000 people reach financial independence. I would love to uh, write a book um, and, and yeah, and provide syndication opportunities to people who don't have uh, opportunities in real estate. So that's kind of my my big vision for where I see my life going. Mm, I love that. Where do you want to travel to? I would love to hit up Tokyo, uh, Japan. I always wanted to hit up Tokyo. Definitely India. You know, I, I, I like their uh, whole culture. I mean, all of Asia. Uh, I'm, I want to buy a condo in Thailand and be like a snowbird uh, in the winter, like go there in the winter in mass and come back to mass in the summer. 
Um, there's just so many places I want to visit. I actually just came back from Peru um, and from Stowe, Vermont at a Go Abundance event. So uh, that gave me a little taste of travel and I want a whole lot more. Awesome, man. I love that. Cool. Well, anything else you want to add before we head into the final part of the show? Thanks, Craig. That was a fantastic question. I think the really important thing I want to really uh, mention is ignore the noise. Like, don't listen to the news. Don't listen to, you know, uh, don't listen to people not in real estate. Like, keep your head down, focus on your daily actions, and you'll be surprised where you can get, you know, um, in a very short period of time. I love that. I I say that exact same thing. Like, uh, just, again, go back to my parents. They they love Fox News and sitting down and watching all that crap. And I just like, just turn it off. Like read a book. Like um, there's so many things you can do in life. And so quickly rather than focusing on world events and uncontrollable things. So it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to your, to your point, one of my favorite uh, speakers, David Osborne, he's the founder of Go Abundance, but he has this concept where it's world one, where it's, every, it's everything you can control and world two, where it's things you cannot control. You got to be in world one as much as possible to truly create the life you want to live. Totally. Totally. And I know like um, my mom and stuff, she, she really loves like TikTok. Um, funny for like a 60 year old lady. Um, and, and I find that when you're on TikTok and you're kind of, there's a lot of fear mongering on TikTok. And so you got to get off of the apps, get off of that stuff. If you're on Instagram or TikTok, it should be because you're producing content for your business. Uh, or if you are consuming content, it's to generate ideas for your business. It shouldn't just be because like, you want to consume content, be more of a producer than a consumer. Yeah. And delete the apps from your phone because they're literally made to make you look at them and to spend hours and hours and hours. Like, And when they're downloaded on my phone, I do that. So I literally have to delete it and get it out of my life to not be consumed by it. Totally. Great advice. Great advice. Awesome, Andrew. Well, this has been amazing, man. So we are going to head into the final part of the show, which Chad, you know what time it is? I do. It's time. For the, for the final, 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 final four. four. All right, Andrew. Or Chad, kick us off. Yeah. Andrew, what book are you currently reading? I am reading Limitless by Jim Quick. And I absolutely love that book. It provides you so many strategies on, on how to be a high performer from utilizing AI to your diet, to speed reading, to mindset. It's an incredibly challenging, it's an incredibly helpful book that I, um, I'm going to study for years and years to come. Awesome. I love that. Um, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Surround yourself around people doing what you want to do. If you want, if you want to own hundreds of units, surround yourself around people who own hundreds of units. If you want to own Airbnb, surround yourself around people who own dozens and dozens of Airbnb, see what they do on a daily basis and simply copy and paste. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. I say that all the time too. What is your why? My real why is I really want to help other people reach financial independence. People have helped me on my journey so much. And I really just want to give back because I wouldn't be anywhere close to where I am today without the mentors in my network and people who helped me get to where I am today. Resonates well. Craig and I are on the same page. Love it. Totally love it. All right, man. What do you think is the most useless word that people use today? I would say the most useless word, in my opinion, is the word quit. Because when you quit, you truly fail. And real go-getters never quit. You never quit if you never give up. And I've had and that strategy has helped me so much on my investing career. If I stopped at the first no from a lender, I would literally own nothing today. But no's literally incentivize me to find a yes. Mm, I love that. Every no is closer to a yes. That's so funny. I, I, I asked that question. It reminds me of like, again, I don't know why. I, my, my mind is back in Massachusetts today because I think because I'm talking to you. Uh, and Brockton is where my grandparents live. And um, she hates, my grandmother hates the word awesome uh, because I use it. I mean, just like people use the word awesome all the time. Instead, she she likes when people use the word swell. And I'm like, that's like the most old thing I've ever heard, right? But like, when was the last time you heard someone use the word swell in like a normal conversation? Craig, you got to start using that. Swell. I should. My grandmother would be really happy. I don't think she <laughs> listens, but if she does, then we'll, we'll start using swell more. Um, <laughs> awesome. Andrew, where can people find out more about you? People can find me on uh, Instagram at Investor Freed, as well as LinkedIn and Facebook at Andrew Freed. I put out a lot of free educational content on how to purchase multifamily, how to be a successful investor. So give me a follow. Awesome. Andrew, thanks so much for coming on, bro. Uh, this was a, such a great time. Good to see you again. Good to watch the beard grow and officially off the screen. So you're, you, you've reached another level of manly in my book. And so um, 
Yeah, man. Th- thanks so much for now your time and we'll, we'll be in touch for sure. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. And this has been a swell podcast. <laughs> swell. And that was Andrew Freed. What'd you think about Andrew, Chad? I thought he was amazing. Obviously a super intelligent guy. Um, but like you had mentioned, you know, it takes a little bit of, of luck, but really it's just taking action. I mean, he took action. He, he and him, like every other first time buyer is fearful of like, this is my first deal. I, should I really be doing this? And he had the agent who's like, yes, do this. And now look where that's brought him um, in just basically three and a half years here. Um, so yeah, I, th- I thought he was an amazing guy and super intelligent and just a go-getter. Yeah. So it was a swell, swell, swell episode. And I think like one thing that I, I know I feel this way when I see some of the people that I first house ha- helped house hack a few years ago now start scaling and doing, you know, bigger things, getting more properties, all that kind of stuff. Like it's kind of like a, like a proud dad moment of like, Oh, look at, look at them. They're like growing up and they're out there crushing it now. And so I would bet that Andrew's real estate agent, who I'm sure he's still in touch with today, probably feels a very similar way about Andrew. And so, yeah, I mean, don't, so I think the moral of the story is, is that like the first one will be scary. 100% of the time it will be scary. It's unknown. People around you are going to tell you that you shouldn't be doing it because the people around you when you're first getting started are likely not real estate investors. They're likely not people that have felt this route. They just, they just heard the bad stuff on the news, which hello, the news makes a lot of money posting horror stories and bad news and fear mongering. And so instead of surrounding yourself with that, surround yourself with people that are, are actually investing, surround yourself with people that are building the wealth and the lives from themselves that they truly want. And then, you know, take advice from them, not like your mom, your dad, your uncle, whatever, if they're not where you want to be. Yeah, 100%. I literally just had that same conversation yesterday with a buyer who's buying their first. And they said, um, like, entrepreneur mindset, but all their friends um, look at them like the ugly duckling and like question what they're doing. And they're in a position where they don't really care. Like, they're doing it, like, they're all in on it. But it's just funny because that's the same way my friends are. Greg, I'm sure you know a million people who are. When you were first getting started, it was like, that's stupid. Like, we're just going to work our nine to five, be comfortable. Um, but that's not the people who get ahead in life. Yeah, I'll never forget. Uh, I was talking to one of my friends from home. And uh, and I told him when I it was probably like 23, 20, 23, 24 at the time. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to retire by 35. And he was like, no chance. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then I was able to retire by 27. Right. Just after a few house hacks. Of course, I didn't retire because I wanted something. I don't know. I I do. I don't mind what I do and I like it. Um, but just kind of like knowing that, all right, like this is possible. And so I, I had to and I'm so friends with that dude today. Like we're still good friends. But um, and he probably doesn't even remember having that conversation. But I remember it because it was kind of like a challenge to me. And so you are going to be around a lot of people that are going to be naysayers. you got to get away from them. Uh, not like you can still be friends with them, but you got to go find new people to really surround yourself with and to people that you want to aspire to be like, and then, you know, your, your net worth will grow. 100%. Awesome, man. Cool. Well, if you haven't already guys, it would be tremendously helpful if you could please, please, please leave us a rating and review on this show, go to Apple iTunes, type in investify the, the more reviews, the more things we get, uh, it just allows us to uh, get on better guests, to keep this show going, and to uh, you know just to continue to have fun in here and keep bringing you guys a ton of valuable content. And so, with that being said, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm the Fly Guy. Chad is Rocky the Realtor on Instagram, and we will see you next time. That's it for this episode of Investify. We hope that these nuggets of real estate wisdom lead to more savvy financial planning and a clearer path towards financial freedom. For more content like this, subscribe to the show at investify.com. Don't forget to leave a rating and share it with your friends. Together, we can transform more real estate newbies into successful and clever investors. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next one.